Please welcome Christopher Bruce. I was a kid who was bullied. I think that if you're bullied and picked on, it always stays with you. It doesn't have to mean that you grow up to be this sad little mess with the stink of the underdog and despair on you, but more like you always remember it. You remember it in vivid detail. Who, what, where. The feeling in the pit of your stomach. In your bone marrow. I remember being bullied more than I remember my successes. That's how I know it was trauma. I used to have this fantasy about going back in time to the very first moment, that very first boy, who called me a faggot. Jay Pinkella was his crappy, puny name. <laughs> it was in front of a whole class of students. I was at my desk, he was at his, two rows over and three seats back. Far enough that he had to yell it, which made it even the more ridiculous when I hung my head and ignored it, pretending that I didn't hear. That was my strategy. So engrossed in my social studies book, pondering the state of New York, stunned, <laughs> bewildered, scared, mortified from the top of my unruly hair that I scotch taped to my head every night after bathing in a feeble attempt to straighten it, to the toes of my Converse All-Stars. I ignored him and I just held my breath. Cheeks flushed, humiliated. In a second, he would stop. I mean, wouldn't he? He had to shut up. If it's not acknowledged, then it absolutely has to stop, doesn't it? It turns out that it doesn't, actually. Especially if it's the beginning. Faggot, fag, sissy. Every imaginable gay obscenity. Loud giggles while the bully holds their arm in the position of a limp wrist. Years of it. Not just Jay. He kicked the door open, which more were happy to walk through in classes, hallways, locker rooms, out the windows of cars on the street, a target on my back all the time. Years later, I would wonder how my life would have been different if I had got out of my seat that first time. If only I had leapt to my feet, crossed over the rows, and back down the aisle, and punched that smirk right off his face. Yeah. Yeah. Pummeled him right into the ground, not stopping until I was the last man standing. And if I wasn't, at least anyone who followed him would now know what to expect. If only I had taken that route. This is something that I believed, even though I knew if I had chosen violence, I would have been fighting every single day of my life. You see, I blossomed between fourth and fifth grade. <laughs> By blossom, I mean that I started to pick up the phone and be mistaken all the time for my mother. <laughs> by people who should have known better, like my father. It wasn't my imagination. I went from being a small town prince of popularity in the Cub Scouts with tons of friends, both boys and girls, to a pariah that older brothers were warning their siblings to not stand next to in the locker room. It was because one day I woke up and my body and voice just betrayed me. A gigantic gay rag doll I became. My hands fluttered by my sides when I ran. My laugh became two octaves up. To try and control it only made me self-conscious. I just wanted to crawl under a rock. Everywhere I went, I was confronted, to which I always reacted the same. I hung my head low and pretended to not to hear. I would walk faster, avoid kids when possible, take another route from school, blast music at home alone in my bedroom, create an active revenge fantasy life. If only I had chose violence as my path. This wouldn't have been popular ideology in my turn the other cheek, God doesn't give us more than we can handle, what doesn't kill us only makes us stronger small town culture. But hey, those optimistic Pollyannas should have spent a day cowering in my shoes. If I had connected fist to jaw, I may have just been liberated. I may have forged a whole other path, become a different kid than the one that couldn't fight back because in his heart he knew what they were saying was true. Someone else, 
I wouldn't have been best friends with Agnes Spackowitz, <laughs> my, my chubby, bleach blonde, Polish soulmate, who was the only train wreck more ostracized than me in my hometown. <laughs> Let's face it, in elementary school, she wasn't my first choice, nor in junior high or in high school either. We were just two carnival goldfish taken home to die in the same confining mold. <laughs> We were gasping for life together because we enjoyed each other's company. In the beginning, we fought like cats every day. I bullied her the way people bullied me. Neither one of us had many other options. Donna Jones was who I wanted to hang with. The chick who came from Yonkers with the marble reds in junior high and the afro pick she carried in her pocket that I only ever saw to use her to clean her teeth. <laughs> this is who the badass me would have rolled with. I was always drawn to the dark side the Scotty on General Hospital as opposed to the Luke and Laura. I just never had those opportunities. If I had knocked Jay's teeth out that first day, taken the heat, told the principal that he called me a faggot and I didn't take that shit, proudly held my head up after, boxing and squaring off, throwing chairs, becoming a disciplinary case, give the teacher something to say at parent-teacher conference night other than I need to spend less time playing with girls. I could have truly scared all of them. Even if I lost the fights, I would have gotten a reputation for being just plain crazy. Whatever you do, don't call him a faggot. He will literally lose his mind. <laughs> the homo kid Joe Pesci of small town suburban New York. <laughs> a loose cannon of violent street, reform school at 15, incarcerated, who knows? <laughs> I'm not saying that I wanted to be a closet case. Maybe the opposite would have happened. I might have been that most impressive of gay kids, the kick-ass superhero who admits it, who owns it, the pioneer, the it gets better before it even got there and became a campaign. <laughs> That's right, Jay, I am queer, what of it? You can kiss my very sweet ass. <laughs> and boom, here's your teeth on the floor for good measure. <laughs> if only. <laughs> That's not how I handled it, though. This past March 6, my husband and I brought home a two-day-old newborn baby boy from the hospital. <laughs> the chances for permanent adoption look good. As we navigate the foster to adopt system, every issue you can possibly imagine at some point comes to the table. Racism, classism, homophobia, addiction. We wonder what's real sometimes of what we might just be projecting. Being a new parent, raising a boy, looking into those sweet, ravenous eyes when I give him a bottle, I can't help reflecting on the man that I hope I have a hand in creating. Who do I hope that he'll be? How will he treat girls, boys? How will he treat himself? I can honestly say I have never imagined him punching a classmate in the face <laughs> in fifth grade. It's not what I envisioned for him, so why would I want to, that do-over for myself? I don't want him hanging his head in shame. Whatever his truth about himself is, there has to be a land of greatness anchored somewhere in between. A plateau where I get to learn from my experience and be there to listen when my son comes home with whatever challenges he may be faced with. Agnes Spackowitz became Agnes Kiss when she changed her name upon marrying. The name stayed even though the husband didn't. She followed me to Los Angeles over a decade ago and now works at UCLA. We've been friends for 40 years. She was at our door to meet the baby when he was only two weeks old. <laughs> Anne Aggie. She brought a onesie with big black letters that blast the slogan, Pants Optional. <laughs> Pants Optional. I hope my kid is that brave. Thank you.